So now we're at the tutorial portion of the class and you're going to be making some recordings this week and doing some simple editing in the Audacity software. So let's just go through that. So first of all, you're going to be recording with your smartphone or if you have an audio recorder, you'll be using that. And where you record, if you're recording voice, where you record is very important. So you're going to want to find an acoustically dead space with no background noises. And what I mean by acoustically dead is there shouldn't be lots of hard, flat surfaces for the sound to bounce off of. And I'll demonstrate what that means in a minute. You, you want something that has irregular surfaces and, uh, and soft surfaces that are going to absorb the sound and keep it from bouncing around so that you really only get the sound that's directly going into your microphone, not all the other sounds that are caused by the sound reflecting off of things in the room. So the ideal place for you to record is in a clothes closet. The ideal place to record is in a clothes closet. So even if you don't have a closet big enough to act fully stand in, if you open the door and face the clothing and hold the audio recorder in front of you, that is going to do a lot to deaden the reflections of the sound and give you a cleaner recording. Also, it's important where you hold the device so that you get the best recording because you want to hold it relatively close to your mouth, but not too close because if you hold a microphone too close to your mouth, you get what's called a proximity effect, which emphasizes the low boomy frequencies in the sound. Here I'll demonstrate. I'm right now, I'm very close to this mic and you should be hearing the proximity effect. And as I back away from the mic, you hear a more naturalistic balance. So I'm about four to five inches away from the mic right now. And also the mic is not pointing directly into my mouth because the air that comes out of the mouth when we're speaking shouldn't hit the diaphragm of the microphone directly. If it does, it's going to create a popping sound that's very difficult to edit around. So you want to be what's called off axis, slightly off axis. You want the microphone pointing across the mouth rather than directly into the mouth or pointing sort of at your cheek rather than at the opening of the mouth. That's the way I have this set up right now is the microphone is sort of about five inches in front of me, slightly to the right of me, and pointing at my right cheekbone. So the puffs of air that come out of my mouth as I'm speaking are missing the diaphragm of the mic, but it's still picking up all of the audio frequencies. Because if you take the microphone too far off axis, you're gonna lose the you're gonna lose certain frequencies within the audio. So one of the assignments I'm gonna give you is to make recordings in different spaces that are av available to you so you can hear the balance between the sound that you're producing, the sound of the reflections that the room is causing, and the sounds of the background noises in the room. And you probably hear a consistent uh, f hum in the background of my recordings because my computer has a loud fan. I use some noise reduction filters to, to get rid of that partially, uh, but it's always slightly present there. Since you'll be recording on a smartphone or an audio recorder, you won't need to have a computer there with you. So you can find an ideal space for recording and record there. Now, I'm not saying that all recordings need to be ideal or should be ideal or should hide the room they're made in. Sometimes it's very interesting to include the room that you're recording in, but learn how to make a clean recording where the room is invisible. Because the nice thing about that is then you can add any room to it using delay and reverberation. You can put your voice in a cave, you can put your voice in a cathedral. But if the room is included in the recording, it's harder to place that sound where you want it to be. It's sort of permanently locked in the place where it's recorded. So let's let's look at an example of this. Here's a recording I made in a large live room. I'm going to open this file into Audacity. On Mac, you can do that by right-clicking the file and saying open with Audacity. Um, another thing you can do is you can command I, get information on the file, and you can specify that you want it to always open with Audacity. And in fact, you can 
say that you want all files of this type to open with Audacity by hitting change all, and it'll prompt you, are you sure you want to change? And you say continue, and now all files that end in the .m4a extension will open in Audacity. And you'll see that I've already done that if I look at this .aif file with command i. You'll see that .aif files are already set to open with Audacity. And the third way, of course, is to be in the Audacity software. And I can tell I'm in Audacity, even if there's no window open, because it says Audacity up here by the Apple, I can say file open. And just open the file. So here's a recording I made in a large live room. And in Audacity, I just click anywhere on the timeline to start playing, or I can click the green play button here. This is an example of a recording made in a large room with large flat parallel walls and background noise. And so what I do at this point in the recording is I raise my voice so that you can hear the effect of the acoustics of the room. You can hear the way my voice is being reflected around the room. You can hear the size and shape of the room as the sound is reflected off of the surfaces. And so that's made at the same distance, about four or five inches away from my mouth, slightly off axis on my smartphone. Um, so using the same distancing, I'm going to take a look at the small dead room. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically dead room with irregular soft objects like clothing and blankets and towels in it. And you can much less hear the size and shape of the room from the reflections because they're broken up by the soft objects in the room. Right, so that recording made in the dead room is much better for us to work with. First of all, it doesn't have the background noise. That large room I was in had like a consistent hum in it. And in this room, you can hear that the silence is actually pretty, pretty clean. There's a volume control here, so I could turn this up. And so I'm just going to turn it up by about nine decibels, just so we can hear the quality of the silence in the room. There's always going to be some sort of background noise in the room, but, uh, but you want it to be as, as minimal as possible. And also, your recording device is always going to inject some noise into the signal. This is inevitable. Sound recordings are never perfect. They're never totally airless. And in fact, they can sound quite unnatural if they are. So let's listen to the background noise in that large room. So I'm going to crank up my gain here. You want to be careful about doing this when you're wearing headphones because it can get quite loud. And we'll listen to that noise. See, that's a much more substantial noise or hum in that room. So that's just not a great recording room. And if you want that echoey quality like this, the size and shape of the room as the sound is reflected off of the surfaces, you can get that. You can create that in the software. And I'll show you that uh, just, it's not necessarily the most important thing to look at first, but it's it's kind of a fun thing to look at first. So we can go back into our small dead room. And I'm going to hit the select button here, which selects all of my sound. The other way you can select all of the sound is with command A. The third way you can select all of the sound is under the select menu, say select all. And you'll find this is a very typical thing in software. There's in a good piece of software, there's always three ways to do the same thing. And it's good to know the three ways because that way you can use the one that you remember first. So we can go here under Effect and we can add Reverb. And Reverb will simulate being in a larger room. So I click on Reverb and it gives me some, some information here and I can preview to hear what that's going to sound like. So, uh, and, and, and I won't go through what all of these settings are right now, um, but you can certainly play with them and see what they produce. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically... Right, so you can hear the space around that voice is being created by this reverberation effect. If I say 
wet only. This is going to produce only the reflections, remove my original voice, and just let you hear this simulated room. And hear the recording made in a more acoustically. And if I hit OK, it'll actually process this sound. Let's make this room even bigger just to be dramatic. Let's see what 86% is like. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically. And so if I hit OK, it will process the sound. And now when I play the sound back. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically dead room with irregular. And of course, what I'm saying doesn't now make sense with the sound of the room. But that's interesting. I've created a dissonance right, between the content of my words and the sound that we're actually hearing. Here's a more extreme example later on. Much less hear the size and shape of the room from the reflections. Because, right, but of course you can much more hear the size and shape of the virtual room or the imagined room that that sound is being made in. I can always undo the reverb and it will go back. But uh, this is, Audacity is what's called destructive sound editing, meaning when I process the sound, for instance, by adding a reverb or by adding some other effect. I'm actually changing the sound file. And that is distinct from the way a lot of other audio editors work, like Ardor that we're going to use later on in the semester, which is much more like Pro Tools, which perhaps you've heard of. That's a non-destructive audio editor in the sense that all the changes you make, all the effects that you add to the sound, all the editing you do, doesn't actually affect the original sound file. The software still references the original sound file and makes those changes to it in real time, whereas Audacity alters the original sound file. And these are, it's not one is better than the other. These are two different approaches to working with sound, and usually you'll use them in combination. All right, so let's look at how to do some basic starting maintenance on the recording. So very typically, one of the first things you do with a recording is a process called normalization. And normalization is scaling that sound's volume up to the digital maximum. What does that mean? Well, let's take the magnifying glass and zoom in on a piece of this sound to see what the sound actually is. I'll take the I-beam, select this thing that we just zoomed in on, and listen to it. Much less here. So it's me saying the words much less here. So let's zoom in even further. Let's just take the word much. Much. Zoom back in on that area of the sound. So you can see here that there's a rising and falling line. That's the waveform of the sound. That's the digital representation of how the molecules in the air are vibrating to create that sound. And that's captured by a microphone. Uh, and a microphone is actually a small wafer that vibrates in sympathy with the vibrations of the air molecules. So this is actually a graph of how that little wafer vibrated when the air that was vibrating hit it. And also, interestingly, this is the shape in which a speaker cone needs to be shaken in order to revibrate the air and recreate the sound. So in a sense, this is a, is a map of how the speaker cone, which is a, essentially a piece of paper driven by an electromagnet, how the speaker cone is going to reproduce the sound. And these are represented in numbers. So if we go in even closer, we can see this is a line that's undulating above and below zero. I'll zoom out a little bit and zoom in a more active part of the sound. Each of these little squares represents the instantaneous position of that microphone wafer when it was recording the sound or of the speaker cone as it's being shaken to reproduce the sound. And the range of these numbers is from negative one to one. So the most extreme positions that the microphone wafer can record are represented by values of one and values of negative one. And similarly, the most extreme position that the speaker can be pushed to are represented by one and negative one. And we can see that the loudest 
peaks of this sound are barely reaching 0.5 and negative 0.5. So what normalization is going to do is going to find the highest peak in the sound, figure out how much it needs to be turned up to fill the entire range from 1 to negative 1, and then scale everything so that the loudest sound actually uses the full amplitude range of the digital signal. We can use this tool to zoom back out to the entire sound, hit the select button to select all, go to effect, normalize, and watch what happens to the sound when we normalize. It's amplified so that the highest peak reaches either one or negative one, and that should be this sound right here. And so when we play this back, it's going to sound considerably louder. And here's a recording made in a more acoustically dead room. And so normalization is a typical first step, but let's look at another audio file where there's a problem with the normalization. Steve. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm speaking to you from another dimension. If I take this file and attempt to normalize it, effect, normalize, okay, it actually gets quieter. Why is that? Because there's already, I'm going to edit, undo, normalize, there's already a sound that's too close to the digital maximum. She. Hello, this is Niav Conti. And she creates a sound that's too loud, so the normalization process actually backfires on us and makes the sound quieter. So we can go into the sound and actually edit it to remove the portion of the sound that's interfering with our normalization. Can take the iBean tool, can highlight that sound that I want to get rid of, and simply delete it. Now, sometimes this will create a little pop in the sound, but very often, if you just are cutting out a little piece of sound and not disturbing the background noise, it won't have a negative effect. Let's just play that section to hear. Hello? Hello? Yeah, no problem at all. So. We'll zoom back out to the full sound. And now, when we normalize, we should see the audio level increase rather than decrease. Effect. Normalize. OK. And there we go. Not very much, because this recording used nearly all of the range, but it did amplify it a little bit. So once you've normalized the sound, the next thing you want to do is do some noise reduction on it. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm speaking to you from another dimension because you can hear that there's some underlying, significant underlying noise. And again, Audacity has a great feature for that. You highlight the noise and teach Audacity about the noise that it needs to reduce. So I highlight the noise. I go to Effect, Noise Reduction, and Get Noise Profile. This will, this will teach Audacity about the noise we're trying to reduce. And then once you've done that, select all, say effect, noise reduction again, and let's try a noise reduction of nine decibels. See what that does. Steve. Hello, this is Niav Conti, and I'm speaking to you from another dimension. This is a kind and loving dimension. It's a very effective noise reduction. Here I'm going to undo so we can hear the difference. Dimension. This is a kind and loving dimension. And redo. Dimension. This is a kind and loving dimension. One. And notice the noise is not entirely gone. We could really do like a 12 or 15 dB noise reduction on this, but it would start to sound strange, actually. Leaving a little bit of noise in the sound is, is not a bad thing.